take a seat. So here's the deal is we're going to have a little bit of time of kind of unpacking uh, the topic, restore peace, that's the name of the workshop, uh, but then some time for Q&A. So feel free to, you know, shoot in some questions through the app, but we'll do kind of throughout the crowd as well if you were at the last workshop uh, as well. But here's the deal is, you know, uh, I would say from this, there is no like softball with this topic, like get ready for a bit of a fastball at like 98 miles an hour, you know. Uh, uh, I think especially with kind of the joint trauma of the world over the last like 18 months. This is just like a huge topic. I've been praying about this for a while. So I'm just going to offer some thoughts, not because I'm the most peaceful person <laughs> by any means. Uh, you know, uh, my life is a mess and a roller coaster just as much. These are just like kind of loose thoughts that I have and we'll unpack some stuff and go from there. You guys ready? Buckle up. It'll be fun. This is going to be a bit of a roller coaster. I want to introduce you to uh, a one of my uh, new kind of favorite heroes. His name's Louis Zamparini, okay, I'm not Italian, so I don't know how to say this. Can we get him up on the on the screen? Louis, hey, there he is. Okay, so Louis, if you don't know, uh, he was an Olympic athlete, uh, 1936 Ber uh, Berlin Olympics, but then fought in World War II for the U.S. Army uh, and was a fighter pilot. Uh, so what's kind of cool, so he was uh, flying over uh, the Pacific Ocean, pretty intense, uh, flying over the Pacific, Pacific Ocean in a... Um, uh, on an airplane, 11 people aboard, uh, they had some malfunctions, and so they actually landed in the Pacific Ocean, and eight of the men died. Three of them survived the crash. He was one of them. Uh, they had two rafts between the three of them. 33 days into being like just living on the raft, one of the guys passed away. They had a shark attack that attacked their boat in the midst of it. They had a, um, a Japanese airplane fly over and start literally shooting at them while they're just like laying in this raft kind of thing. Uh, Louis actually survived 47 days with little to no food. They would literally like kill seagulls that landed on their raft uh, and almost no water. The only water that they had was from rain, right? Uh, when he actually got off the raft, he landed in Japan and became a prisoner of war. It's a whole crazy story. If you've ever seen the movie Unbroken, uh, there's two, ver two versions of it. Super intense. I mean, this was just like the beginning of just the craziness of this man's life. Uh, as I was watching the movie in particular, uh, what I found so fascinating, like the irony of ironies, was him being in the uh, Pacific Ocean, surrounded by water, but dying of thirst. Surrounded by water, but dying of thirst. What an irony, <laughs> right? To just be there <laughs> and being completely surrounded, but obviously with salt water, yet dying of thirst. I think in many ways that is our situation as Americans, as human beings living on this planet. Uh, we are surrounded by a ton of things that do not satisfy. I said this quote in, um, in the men's session. The most quoted quote that's ever been quoted in the history of quotes is from St. Augustine. He says, um, we have been created, our hearts are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, our hearts have been made for you, O Lord, and they are restless until they rest in you. There is a reality, just a little bit of a reality check, that we will never truly find peace in this world. We'll never truly find peace in this life because we were not made for this world. I want to share with you a quote from C.S. Lewis, one of my all-time favorite quotes. If you can get C.S. Lewis, okay. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. This is reality. We have a different horizon line, amen. Our destiny is to be with our maker, to be with him in communion with him. But the reality is, is that our world is surrounded by chaos. I don't know if you've noticed, right, between political unrest, the COVID-19 pandemic, like, I mean, the last 18 months has just been a joint trauma of the world. It's amazing to see the divisions that have happened, so many different things, and that's just outside, right? That's outside of our communities in a lot of ways. What about our families? What about our friendships? What about our interior, our own life, right? This is true, okay? And I'm just, again, this is kind of a hard ball, <laughs> uh, a bit of a fastball this afternoon. Life is very hard. Like, I'm 35 years old. Life is incredibly challenging. Giving your life over to Jesus doesn't make it easier. It makes it more meaningful. <laughs> it's filled with meaning and purpose, but it doesn't make it easier. 
If you want to say yes to Jesus because you want an easier life, you will be sorely mistaken. Actually, his life is something that is challenging, but oh, is it fulfilling and good and transformative. And it's worth every single moment because it brings life, new meaning and purpose. We are just thrown into this world. Think about how many decisions you have made today. You've literally made thousands upon thousands of decisions. You decided if you wanted to brush your teeth or not this morning, right? Uh, you decided what to have for breakfast if you even ate it all. You decided to wear the shirt that you're wearing unless your youth group leader, like, forced you to wear that shirt, which they probably did if you have, like, a uniform shirt. Uh, but here's something you did not decide. Of all the decisions that you get to make every day, you didn't decide to exist, right? Okay? You didn't decide to exist. We are brought into this world. We didn't choose it. We're brought into this world, and now it's like, okay, figure it out. (laughs) And life is really hard because of the chaos that surrounds us. We live in a world of agitation, of trouble, of excessive hurry. (laughs) Uh, People trying to numb this restlessness within them in so many different uh, ways, so many sorts of, uh, of options that are out there, and life is hard and challenging. How do we navigate that? Because even that surrounding us, even within us, we are filled with thoughts and feelings and desires, and they're all over the place. We have estimated fi- uh, 50,000 thought fragments every single day. Each individual person has 50,000 thought fragments every single day. How do we sort through that? How do we navigate that? Our feelings are up and down like a roller coaster, depending on a a variety of different factors. Our desires are all over the place, some good, some bad, right? How do we navigate all of this? At the end of the day, Jesus, (laughs) right? The typical, like, kind of youth group or, like, religious education answer, like, Jesus is the answer, and that's because he honestly is, What he says at the end of Matthew 11 is, Come to me, all you who who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. What is the rest that he's talking about? It's not a nap, (laughs) right? It's not a vacation. It is a life of peace. It's a lifestyle to be at rest, to be at peace with him. Jesus really is the answer. He has a plan for you, for your good. We've been talking about this all weekend, how much he loves us and cares for us and desires to be with us. There's something I've been doing with my kids, and maybe a lot of people do this with their kids, I don't know. But uh, my, uh, my daughter, Regina, we call her Gigi, She's like the cutest thing in the world. Um, I hold her at night because I help her go to, uh, go to sleep at night. And uh, the last thing that we do is we do kind of just like a few little prayers. And so I say, Gigi, where's your heart? And she goes, right? I say, where's daddy's heart? She goes, say, and who's in our hearts? Jesus. Because it's true. She's baptized. If you've been baptized, the love of God has been poured into your hearts. You are actually never alone. Like, literally think about that. No matter the isolation, no matter the difficulty, no matter the pain, no matter the, uh, the disquiet that is within you, you're absolutely never alone because of the God that has been poured into your heart. That God is love, and that love is stronger than death, my friends. It's a really big deal, and he is always, always with us. I want to share with you a scripture passage. This is from uh, Mark 4. And uh, if we could have the boat image come up, awesome. This is one. Of, uh, this is from Rembrandt. It's one of my favorite images, and it's of a uh, storm at the sea. And this actually, uh, when the pandemic first broke out, Pope Francis uh, gave like kind of a prayer service. It's called the Urbi et Orbi blessing, uh, where he blessed the whole world in a way to kind of protect the whole world. Um, uh, in the midst of the kind of initial moments of the pandemic, and he actually used this gospel uh, in the midst of that, uh, that time of prayer. It says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, with him, they took him with them just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat a- into the boat, so that the boat was already filling But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. 
and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Why have you no faith? And they were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? My friends, it is better to be next to Jesus in the midst of the storm. Amen? It's better to be with Jesus in the midst of the storm. Like even thinking the disciples, they're actually in the boat. They're super agitated. They're running around trying to figure out how to do it. It is better to be with Jesus in the midst of the chaos that surrounds us. Because he's resting. He's not worried. What does he speak? He says, peace, be still. (laughs) Maybe a prayer can be, Jesus, can you say that to my heart? (laughs) Peace, be still. Because he has the power He's the one that wants to free us from sin and death and brokenness and give us peace. Okay, a couple of practicals I want to run through uh, in thinking about this because I think in the midst of all of this, it's like, okay, good, 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 that's great, but how do we make some of this practical? Uh, And I'm going to run through a number of different kind of thoughts that I've had. Again, these are just kind of thoughts that I've had to navigate the last 35 years of my life, and so just kind of some free thoughts. First one is if you want to be anchored in a life uh, of peace and quiet and calm with Jesus at the center of your life, you have to have Jesus at the center of your life, (laughs) right? Uh, There is no peace outside of Christ. You've seen it on bumper stickers, no Jesus, no peace, right? Then no Jesus, no peace, right? You've seen this? Yeah, it's probably from the 80s, something like that. Maybe you haven't. Uh, uh, We need to be right with God. This is why we've been saying, hey, you should go to confession all weekend. We need to be right with God. You need to take time for prayer to let the love that has been poured out within you kind of come alive in your heart. That is where we will actually find peace. We need to get right with God. Next one is uh, um, what people have kind of called the difference between your circle of influence and your circle of concern. Your circle of influence and your circle of concern. So a circle of concern is something that is out of your control. The weather, right? The pandemic. Uh, Decisions that your principal makes that you don't like, right? And then your circle of influence is the thing that is within your control, right? Uh, Here's the deal, okay? And I'm going to qualify this in just a second. But you have free will. Like, there is such a thing to surrender to God's will. But you have freedom. You have freedom to choose. My friends, you are in control of your life. Stress, disquiet often comes about when we are not responding to the responsibilities that are presented to us. Responsibility, when you think about it, it is response-able, right? You can kind of take the bull by the horns in certain areas of your life, whether they're physical or emotional or psychological or spiritual, right, and actually respond to those stresses. If there's certain things that you're stressed out about, well, take an honest look at that. What can you choose, right? Because there's certain things that are out of your control uh, that's challenging, but sometimes we get so worried about the things that are out of our control that we don't actually take care of what's in our control. And if we focus on that, oftentimes stress tar- tends to go away, right? Uh, this is speaking from somebody that has lots of anxiety. So just as a, a little note. Okay, next one is knowing yourself. Uh, here's the reality, and this is going to make me sound like an old fogey. I'm sorry. Uh, you, you're in high school. You do not know yourself well. You don't. You don't know yourself well. You don't know the desires of your heart as well as you ought to. You don't know your kind of inner workings as well as you like as well as you ought to. That's okay, right? Uh, But what can you do to remedy that? (laughs) What can you do to get to know yourself better? There's lots of great like personality tests and understanding what it is that stresses you out. What are the things that actually cause you disquiet? Bringing about some kind of understanding about those things is super helpful. Right? Uh, so what are the ways that you can really get to know yourself better? Right? Thinking of peace, you're never going to actually find real peace without a real honest look at the things that are 
not peaceful in your life, right? And taking a real honest look and having the risk and the courage to be able to dive into that, to face those fears, right? Uh, oftentimes, we don't face our fears because we think that it will show us that we're weak, you know, and we avoid it because we think that we're, there, that we're weak, and we start to compare ourselves with all these people that are strong, right? And the reality is a lot of people that have the facade that they're so strong and so confident, it's um, it's actually a real weakness <laughs> because uh, uh, they're not willing to actually dive into those difficult places, right? Let us be men and women that are not alone, that have Jesus with us, and we're willing to dive into those difficult places because that's where Jesus wants to be. He wants to be the peace in your soul, right? He wants to shine his light in those areas, coming to know ourselves better. Uh, next one, finding a way to process. One of the greatest things that I think most, I mean, most people could do is to journal. <laughs> if you've never had a habit of that, not because you're going to give it to somebody, not because, you know, somebody's going to make you a saint and quote from you on Instagram or something. Like, like just to journal so that you have an opportunity to process all the thoughts and feelings and desires that are going on in your heart, right? Also to have a really good friend that you can confide in, right? easy way to achieve more peace, to be more anchored, is to actually process with a friend, certainly with a uh, kind of a mentor, right? A priest, a youth minister, uh, certainly a counselor, if it's a more like a uh, kind of dire mental health situation. Uh, I have gone to counseling before. When we got, in, my wife and I got engaged, a number of things came up. It was one of the greatest things that I chose for our marriage, right? Was to actually dive into some of the things that I needed to process and have somebody point out, hey, Hey, you should look at this, right? Uh, so such a great thing. Finding ways to process that inner life, that inner world. The next one is for some of you, you feel really deeply. <laughs> you feel really deeply. I get it. <laughs> I'm kind of a melancholic, as uh, Jackie was talking about before. Like I wallow in my pit. You know, somebody says something to me and I think about it for like the next six days. And then I think, oh, I should have said this to them. You know, it's just like I just like stir around things. Get out of your head. <laughs> Often, like, get out of your heads. Do something physical in a real way to get out of your head. One of the things that I do, I play guitar. One of the reasons I love playing guitar is it just helps me process and kind of get out of up here because I get so kind of focused on my thoughts and they go and they go and they go. It's an easy kind of release in a certain, excuse me, in a certain sense. Uh, um, again, uh, kind of finding those ways to process things. The other piece kind of related to it is God deals with what's real. God deals with r what's real. I remember speaking to a teen one time, and he was all freaked out about where he was going to go to college. It was fall semester junior year. And I was like, okay, where are you thinking of going to college? He told me three places. I was like, do you have enough information to make a decision right now? And he was like, no. I was like, what do you need to do? Well, I need to visit the campuses. When does that happen? Oh, at the end of my junior year, I'm going to go visit those three. I was like, so you don't have enough data to make a decision. Well, why are you stressing about a decision you don't have enough data to make, right? God deals with the real. If you're stressed out about a certain decision, if that's what's causing you stress, do you have enough information to actually make a decision, right? God deals with what is real. You need to have that data uh, to be able to make a decision, that kind of thing. Okay, next one, and Jackie spoke about this quite a bit, but the idea of trust. Uh, my friends, you cannot love someone that you do not trust. You cannot love someone that you do not trust, especially when it comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people uh, can say they love Jesus, but it's really difficult to say that they trust him. Really great little exercise a priest told me to do one time is for uh, uh, to say, Jesus, I love you, ten times in prayer. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And then go to Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you 10 times. Really simple way to increase our trust and our capacity for trusting Jesus. Again, you cannot love someone you do not trust. And we need to be able to trust in our Lord. Uh, another one, and Jackie mentioned this as well, but I thought it was just so beautiful, so I'm going to reiterate it, uh, is to have a consistent habit of forgiving people. <laughs> uh, and when I say this, it's saying, Jesus, I forgive this person for this. 
to specifically name what it is that we need to forgive people for. And this could be something small, could certainly be something big as she was talking about it. But Jesus came for the forgiveness of sins, to forgive our sins, but also that we as Christians would be able to forgive our brothers and sisters, our family members. My friends, we need to have a sense of forgiveness to really seek to forgive others. Jesus, in your name, I forgive so-and-so for whatever it is. Uh, The next one is to be perfect in love, perfect in charity, uh, but not perfectionism. (laughs) We can get so focused, I think, especially in the church, that we need to fit all these, like, nooks and crannies and be this, like, cookie-cutter image of what it means to be a perfect Christian and kind of our ideal, our ideal of what a perfect Christian looks like, right? Jesus is asking you to be perfect in love, to love freely, to love as a gift, to give of yourself away uh, for those around you, to love him passionately, not to be, quote, perfect in every single way, right? Uh, There's a, a, a stark difference, right? One is a free gift. The other one is more like an idol in a certain sense because you're idolizing a certain uh, kind of perfection sort of mentality. Uh, next one is to embrace the ordinary. And I think this is so huge right now. Uh, We look to so many different people uh, through social media, through different outlets to, um, uh, in a certain sense, for like a comparison game, right? They have like these extraordinary lives and we think, oh, they have such an extraordinary life that means there's something wrong with me and I need to somehow emulate them, right? To embrace what is ordinary. When you look at the lives of the saints, they were ordinary men and women that loved passionately, that lived in extraordinary faith, right? Embrace what is ordinary because that's where God is. He's found in the present moment. He's found in the real. Uh, Next one is learning to say no. (laughs) Goodness, my friends, say no to something. It's a great habit to have, especially for those of you who get involved in like a thousand different clubs. And now because like we're coming out of COVID a little bit like this fall, I'm going to do everything. Like don't do everything, you know, like it's okay to say no to a few things. St. Francis says do few things and do them well. Do few things and do them well. Next one. Uh, (laughs) we'll, We'll call this one the last one. Uh, is to see the big picture. I want to show you one of my all-time favorite paintings. It's in the Art, Art Institute of Chicago. You could have it come up. Painting. There we go. Art Institute of Chicago. If you don't know what it is, but it's called uh, Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Ranjat. La Ranjat is an island that takes or that's in France. French impress- impressionist named George Seurat. He developed what's called pointillism. Keep going. Pointillism. Uh, is literally just dots, right, in such a way. Last one. You've seen this picture, I'm sure, right? Uh, So it's estimated that in this painting, it's uh, 12 feet by 17 feet. Uh, There's over 4 million tiny little dots that make up this picture. Whatever it is that you're feeling, it's real, (laughs) right, and it matters, but it's also not going to last forever, Whatever it is that you're experiencing is real and it matters, but it's not going to last forever. We need to be people that see the big picture because this is more of what God sees. Oftentimes, the way that we experience things, we're flush right up next to it. You know, uh, We're face to face with it and it's real and it hurts. We feel it deeply, but God sees the big picture. He sees the real you, the real redeemed man or woman that you're called to be, and he is always with us. Amen? Awesome. Good. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. Can you guys, again, just kind of stand for a second? Do a little stretch break while we do the Q&A. Jackie's going to come up. Give it up for Jackie. <laughs> so, again, uh, similar if you were at the last workshop, we're going to uh, be fielding questions kind of uh, uh, kind of in the house, but also via the app. Hi, Jackie. Hi. How are you? Good. <laughs> That's good. All right, let's take uh, question number one. Question number one. Mm. I asked Father if he could come up and answer this question. <laughs> Father, who is in, who is, you're a certified mental health, like, he's, he's, a, tra- the he's a trained counselor, I like so this was a like good this. question. How do I combat scrupulo- scrupulosity and OCD? This was a good question, so the trained counselor is going to. 
This is a, uh, yeah, I'm a priest who shrinks head. That's what I do for a living. Um, so this is, it's actually a very, it's much longer answer than I can probably give you like in this type of setting, but there's two types of scrupulosity and one is more, um, it's kind of an issue of maturity where if somebody can get a little bit of good teaching, good mentorship, good theology, they can kind of naturally outgrow it. But some people who suffer from scrupulosity, it's actually a form of obsessive compulsive disorder, which is, which, is, which is at its root an anxiety disorder, right? And so it's important if you have that type of scrupulosity to really make sure that you're getting counseling because it really is type, it, it's a type of anxiety disorder. It's important also to understand that as you're working with scrupulosity, you also have to kind of heal your image of God as well. Okay, so like I actually teach this in a course I teach here at the university called Human and Spiritual Integration. And Pope Benedict XVI, a number of years ago, got in a whole lot of hot water um, in the city of Regensburg for making an address that was perceived to be offensive to Muslims. But what he was actually doing is kind of comparing the difference between the two different theologies of God. And one of the things that he says in, in his address essentially is that God is reasonable. Okay. God is reasonable. So if somebody suffers from scrupulosity, you could be sitting there with Pope Benedict XVI here and Pope Francis here, and you could be sitting there making your confession, and Pope Francis could say, Benny, what do you think of that? And Pope Benedict XVI would say, I believe with moral certainty that he is not in a state of mortal sin. And Francis would be like, yeah, bro, go ahead. <clears throat> and then that person would walk out and say, but maybe I intended to deceive them. You see what I mean? It's obsessive compulsive, right? And so part of it is, is healing your image of God and recognizing that as Roman Catholics, one of the things that we believe about God is that God is reasonable, okay? So you're struggling with something you know, like, you, you know, you have uh, whatever you think that you're doing over and over again. And, you know, it's a matter of trusting that God, your father, understands that you're struggling. You're not trying to pull the wool over his eyes. You know, he understands. Healing your image of God and understanding that God, your father, is reasonable. Why is that important for your generation? And I sound like a very old man when I say that. Okay, so Miss Witham, who is our admissions rep, <coughs> was telling me that this week she had some people who were applying to the university. They are sophomores in high school, and they're like, am I too late? Am I too late? Am I too late? It's like, you're a sophomore in high school, but the way that you guys have grown up, you have grown up with lots of anxiety lots of expectations, lots of needs to perform, to jump through hoops, to look a certain way. So you guys are kind of predisposed to experience anxiety, okay? And that's why it's important to understand as Catholics, God, our Father, is reasonable. And you don't need to be anxious with him because he's not against you. So if you are really genuinely scrupulous in the sense that it's obsessive compulsive disorder, to be perfectly honest, you need some therapy for that because it's an anxiety disorder. But there's also the part of it that's healing your image of God and recognizing that if you're predisposed toward anxiety, your image of God may need a little bit of healing because your parents have placed these expectations. See, I'm Generation X. My generation had babies. Scary stuff. We had you guys. And we became very, well, I didn't, but they did. <laughs> and so you guys have grown up in a world where you've, and I'm going to, this is going to irritate some people maybe a little bit, helicopter parents and social media and all that stuff, you guys feel lots of anxiety, right? And if you've got an anxiety disorder, find a good shrink, get some help, work on your image of God, and you can make some progress on this. Thank you. Yeah, Give it up for Father. That was great. <laughs> I was going to say, can you just stay up here? <laughs> I know. Well, we'll probably. And I think the, what I love is, like, you guys, therapy is not a bad word. Amen? Like, if, if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, I mean, there's a whole host of things, like, so many people struggle with. You're not, number one, you're not alone. But, two, like, therapy is not a bad word. Like, it, please, go see a therapist. It's just tools 
in the toolbox to help you be as healthy and holy as you can be. Amen? God wants you to be emotionally healthy, physically healthy, spiritually healthy. We are whole persons. So if, if you're struggling with anything, especially as stuff comes up this week, like uh, even this next question, someone said, I am so terrified of hell. This fear makes it difficult to trust God. How do I overcome this? Let go and trust God. Now, I don't know if behind this is an anxiety disorder. It could be like 20, per I, I don't know if this is right, but I read that 20% of our culture has like general anxiety disorder. And it makes, it, it, again, this is something you would need to go to therapy for. If this is not an anxiety disorder, I would just, the, the, the scripture that comes up is perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. We should not, in fact, one of, I would recommend um, the consecration to divine mercy or I think, is that what it's called? The St. Therese, it's Father Michael Gately's, um, the, I, I just did it, but it's all St. Therese, and St. Therese was not afraid of, she had a fear of hell in the sense of, like, she knew God was real and his justice was real, but she was so believed in God's mercy and love, she was like, of course God, like, not like, of course I'm going to go to heaven, but it was like, God loves me so much, you know, yeah, he's like, I'm going to come up and say something, um, like, not that I'm presuming I'm going to heaven, but as a parent, of course I want my children in heaven. Like, the people that go to hell, you guys, God doesn't send people to hell. We choose, it, we reject God until the very last moment of our life. We send ourselves there. God does not send us there. We basically are rejecting God till the very last moment of our lives. And we're saying, God, I don't want to spend eternity with you. And, and so don't be afraid. We should not fear hell if we have the love of God. Perfect love casts out all fear. And again, love God. Um, I don't know. You obviously have something. Yeah, sure. There's a, okay, I can do that. Um, I get paid big bucks for this stuff. Yeah, right. Lies. <laughs> lies. Vow of poverty. Um, so uh, there's a book I want to recommend to you um, on Therese of Lisieux. And, and the name of it escapes me. It'll come to me before the end. But one of the things that St. Therese, and this is brilliant Catholic logic here. She says that I can believe in God's mercy. In other words, she says this. God is merciful because he is just. So in my work as a counselor, I see this all the time. Like when people have different, and when I hear confessions, one of the things I tell people is that the sin is the symptom. So in my work as a counselor, you sit there and you see people behave in all of these crazy ways. But as what I see, the more years I do this, is that once you hear somebody's story, the behavior makes sense. Okay, so I had parents that were not that affectionate. Maybe I was abandoned as a child, whatever it was. And so, you know, your emotions are completely flatlined because of this experience of childhood depression. And what happens is the brain starts looking for something to feel good. And so that's why people get into drugs. That's why people, the technical name for that is anhedonia, the inability to feel happiness. And some people have it because of early childhood wounds. And when I hear people's stories, I understand that. Sometimes the stuff that people are doing is their brain's way of adapting to get good feelings of dopamine and stuff like that so it can feel good. Okay? If I as a shrink can understand why people do the stuff they do, can God Almighty who created the universe figure out why people do the stuff that they do? Okay? So if God in his infinite wisdom, he made the human brain, by the way, he knows how it works way better than we do. So if I as a counselor in my practice can sit and listen to somebody tell a story and understand why behaviorally and neurologically the way they are, can God figure this out? So this is why St. Therese says God is merciful because he is just. Because he gets it. Because he understands. He knows why we do the stuff that we do. Therese of Lisieux, God is merciful because he is just. <laughs> He's going to stay up here. <laughs> That's good. Why don't we grab one from the crowd? If there's anybody, you know, raise hands. One back here. All right. So... One question that I had was, 
Okay. Yeah, one question that I had was if someone is like atheist or like just against God in general, um, what's a good way that they could actually know God is real? I mean, I know what I would say, but I want you to answer. Yeah, I think, no. you know, um, uh, so somebody's an atheist, one way that they could know that God is real, you know, I think in that kind of dialogue with somebody, uh, you know, using scripture or uh, other like kind of church things oftentimes don't work because they don't believe in scripture. You know, they don't believe in the church, that kind of thing. Um, but one thing that I would say is their conscience, right? Everybody ha experiences some sense of conscience. Uh, and uh, every, in a certain sense, like every civilization has found that there's something wrong with the world, right? Uh and I think between those two things, you can start to talk to them a bit of like, okay, why is that there? Why do you have this experience of a conscience, right? And how does that actually play out? Uh, and also that there is something wrong with the world. What is our answer for that? What is the, uh, the way that we can actually express that and explain that? And those might actually be like some good starting places to get them towards the idea of belief in God. Yeah, I would say atheists, I, you know, just knowing, hearing conversion stories from different people, some people experience God in nature, in his creation. I mean, it says in the catechism, we can experience God through his creation. I mean, I like experience God all the time through nature. I love going out and walking, and I love water and the ocean and all that stuff. We can know God through revelation, right, through um, through history. We can know, I know some people who are atheists who, like, just even having conversations with them, like logical conversations about kind of stuff like this, like, why do you want to be happy? What were you made for? Just like questions why we're asking, like, um, how, why do we have sin? Like, what do you do with sin? And Why do you get out of bed every morning? <laughs> like, what would actually be their yeah, answer Yeah, what's your purpose in life? Like Some that. people have never asked those questions. Um, I work for Word on Fire with Bishop Barron, and so, like, Bishop Barron, I read all the time people's conversions just because they've never before been asked these questions and just through logic. So a lot of people have different ways of coming to know God. It's so different. We all have different ways. Father? The one thing I would add is ask them to make a bet with God and say, because if God exists and he knows us, then he can speak to us all individually in a way that we can understand and challenge them to, to, to say a prayer and say, God if you exist, speak to me in a way that I can understand. And the rest is really God's job. Your job is just to witness to your belief and to try to cultivate in them some openness, but put it in those terms. I want to challenge you to make a bet with God and say, God, if you are up there, if you exist, if there's anybody up here who can hear this, make yourself known to me in a way that I can understand. All right. Next question. Uh, does God still love those who don't believe in him? Absolutely. We're his children. Great question. Yeah. Do we stop loving our children because they don't, like, want to hang out with us? No. Kind of even what Father was saying before, it's rooted in relationship, right? Uh, God is a father. He desires a relationship with his children. Um, next one I want to pull out just because I know this one's super practical. How does someone manage anxiety in a small group? I really want to put uh, uh, my all into the small group and be comfortable with people, but I still get nervous. One thought, just because, uh, you know, I mentioned it before, I've had a number of different struggles with anxiety. Something that's helpful for me in this scenario, and, you know, would just say it, two things. One is to let the group leader know that's actually leading the small group. It's just like, hey, I feel really anxious in the small group, just so you know, so that the group leader is aware and that they can kind of help uh, facilitate a little bit. The other thing would be prior to going to the small group, write down a few things on a piece of paper of what you would desire to share. Because a lot of times it's like, okay, in the moment, I don't know exactly what to say. Again, processing through writing is a really helpful thing, I think, especially for people that uh, can kind of struggle with anxiety. One thing that's helpful for my clients who suffer with social anxiety is, <clears throat> so in cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a thing called mind reading, right? And so for people who suffer from social anxiety, you know, someone who suffers from social anxiety will walk into a room and they think that everybody is staring at them. 
and that if I say something the wrong way, oh my God, I'm going to look stupid and this person is going to think I'm so stupid and then he's going to tell everybody else how stupid I am and the whole rest of the world is going to think I'm a moron and then I'm going to be the cat lady, okay? And people who suffer from social anxiety, what they're doing is they're actually giving the other people in the room too much credit, okay? If you suffer from social anxiety, one thing that's important to know is that the people are not noticing all the stuff that you think they're noticing. Because you're hyper aware, you're projecting that onto everybody else and thinking that they're hyper aware and you're giving them too much credit, okay? So if you have like a little dot of makeup that isn't quite covering that zit, you know what? Mm, they probably don't know, okay? Like I if you're that guy that, you know, you just said something a little bit foolish and maybe like, oh, like that other bro, like his muscles are bigger than mine, he's got a better beach body and all the girls are going to think he's cool and they're going to hate me and I'm going to be a loser. Ugh. Like, y y you're giving them too much credit. They don't notice 99% of the stuff that you notice. Relax. So good. Thank you, brother. Great. This is another good one. Someone told me that it's a sin to worry because it's like saying we don't trust God. Is that true or to what extent? What are your thoughts? Is it a sin to worry? <laughs> Father. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I should be getting a check for this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, I would say, you know, like, so when I was nine years old, I went into a, com a coma and almost died and was diagnosed with, with diabetes. Should my mother not have worried? Well, if she's a rational human being, she's going to worry, okay? And, it is, and I think some people get, get really, there, there's, there's such a thing as normal, rational worry, okay, because we as human beings, our brains are hardwired to keep us safe, and, and that's probably what that worry is trying to do, and you have to work through some things like, do I really need to be worrying about this as much or not, but is it a sin to worry most of the time? Now, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your worry is, is maybe rooted in vanity or something, maybe you need to work on your vanity or fear, like you need to work on the underlying cause, but is worrying a sin? I think, honestly, most of the time, probably not. Yeah, like, that's a... I, I just said, did, Ma did Mama Mary worry when Jesus was gone for three days? Of course she did. She's a mama. But she also trusted in God's plan completely. I can say there have been times I have worried, but I, at the same time trusted. I've been like, okay, God, I know, I, I trust you, and I know you're going to do amazing things. I'm still like, oh. You know, and it, yeah, it's an emotion. You guys, emotions. Yeah, that was a good. That was a good question. Thank you for that answer. I was just gonna uh, say too, and kind of related to something I mentioned in the talk is that emotions are real. Um, uh, how are we going to? It, it's what we choose to do with the emotion, right? I'm a big fan of just like acknowledging things. Like where you're at is where you're at, and where you're at's okay. Like acknowledging the emotion that you're experiencing or that you're feeling, uh, because it's real and it matters. But uh, the decision of where that goes or how that's like manifested, what the next step is, that's up to you and that's the reason God gave you freedom to choose, right, is how you're going to respond to that emotional response. Man, we have like 20 seconds left. Mm. What do you want to do? Let's do one more. Okay. <laughs> Were you actually stuck at the airport? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, real quick, someone, can I answer? Yep, in like 15 seconds. How do I talk with someone who is part of the LGBTQA every letter plus while being respectful but not also putting my opinion down? Does God love people who are gay, transgender, LGBTQ? Does he love them? Yes. Yes. Does God also have a plan for marriage and family? Yes. You guys, here's the deal. is like I don't hate anybody. I love every person. Now, I also believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe the Catholic Church has the fullness of truth. And so it's absolutely possible. I know somebody I know is a, is a lesbian, and she's married, and all this stuff. Like, do I love her? Absolutely. Do I want her to know? The first thing is I want her to know Jesus. I'm not going to be like, hey, don't be married lesbian. I'm going to be like, I want you to know Jesus because I know that the desire of every heart 
desires love and happiness, and we all desire God. And it says in the catechism, we all desire truth and love, and we will never be satisfied until we find God. He is the only one who will satisfy that desire for truth and happiness that we always long for. So, of course, we can talk with people. Now, granted, if people are disrespecting you, period, and your beliefs, sometimes it's not worth it. Like, I've had conversations with people just who are not even, that they kind of hate Catholics. And at some point, I kind of say to them, like, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you anymore because you're disrespecting me and my Catholic faith, and you're not actually listening. If, if someone's willing to have a conversation with me, I will talk to them all day. I will love them wherever they are. But if someone is being absolutely rude to me and my beliefs, I'm going to just at some point say, sorry, I'm not going to take your, your – I'm not going to be your punching bag, okay? Um, but absolutely, we, we are called to love everybody and call – we are all called to holiness, and we want everybody to know the love of God. And God has a plan for love and marriage. I could talk for so much longer about this, but we are out of time. So, yeah, Father. One quick thing. Um, Jesus would rather have people believe in him and be wrong about something than not believe in him at all. Does that make sense? So that person is more likely to love Jesus if they feel love from you. Then if a door opens, maybe you can witness to them about, study John Paul II, Theology of the Body, witness to them about God's plan for marriage. But it's better for people to have a little faith in Jesus than no faith in Jesus at all. And he would rather have them know him and be wrong about something than not know him at all. Y'all are awesome. We love you so much. Thank you, guys. Seriously. Uh, and I was saying before, just to kind of like wrap this up, Jesus is always with you, no matter what. Right? Uh, Father, uh, Jackie, thank you. See you all soon. Peace. We'll be back Peace. tonight.